Hiya. Hi, how are you? I'm good, thanks. So, Tracy, you've got a, an event coming up, well, like a, a global event, really, called Downshifting Week. Uh, that's starting on the, I think it's the 21st, is it? Uh, could you tell us a bit more about that? Ah, Downshifting Week, yes. Um, well, I can tell you what it is. I can tell you when. When I did it, when I started it, uh, it was rolling up towards the winter and um, I was in a very cold cottage with no central heating and some uh, fingerless gloves on. And I had a desk lamp, um, which had a, an old fashioned bulb in. So it was a warm desk lamp. And I used to poise that over my fingers so that I, would keep, I could keep them warm so I could type. And I was just, I don't know, I was uh, feeling very disjointed from society and uh, the way things were all running around. Everyone was just trying to earn lots of money. There was tons of stuff on the telly telling people to just earn, earn, earn. And I just thought, do you know what this is? These are all the wrong messages. And I thought I was, I'd was. i been writing about downshifting and simple, sustainable living options for quite a while. And I thought... How do I simplify my life? And I thought, I'm going to stick a week together. I'm going to create a week for downshifters to hang their mad ideas on and say, do you know what? Actually, they're not that mad. Other people must be thinking it. If there's a week, that means other people feel the same way I do. So on that chilly November, I sat and decided to just, you know, create an awareness campaign. And I, look, I looked into doing it. And uh, I thought there must be somewhere you need to register with a special bit of paper or something. And um, you uh, you can declare it national pick your nose day if you want to. Um, and if you can get enough people picking their nose with you, it's a national initiative. Uh, it's quite simply uh, as easy as that. Um, so I did. And um, it's attracted readers and contributors and just people sharing their thoughts on simple green living from all over the world and it never fails to inspire me um i did a piece recently with a wonderful lady in russia of all places and um the the, the downshifting movement is expanding in russia i mean i certainly know it's yeah which is incredible um but it, it, what i think surprises me most is that it's still uh, in, it's still coming forward in a lot of the emerging markets, um, which are all sort of out there running around and, and earning lots more money. Um, these people are sort of saying, actually, we don't want to make the mistakes of the people in the West. We are quite happy with a simple life. I think we'll stick with that, please. Keep your stress. So it is even, you know, and India and places like that, it's coming, it's, it's, it's got a, a, a strong foothold everywhere. Um, there's not a country uh, that I'm aware of that it really doesn't touch. So downshifting is, um, yeah, going to continue to to get bigger. So it's it's all about essentially looking for ways to simplify your life and, you know, live a less stressful life. You know, just get back to some basics, really. We don't need all this sort of consumerism and all the things that television tells us to need. Uh, most of it's unnecessary. Very true. True. Um, uh, the trouble is, is that from every uh, angle of society, all of the media angles generally um, of society, magazines, newspapers, if you read them, um, telly, if you watch it, I don't read uh, read magazines or, or newspapers and I don't watch the telly. I only listen to the radio and that's true. Um, but if you do, then you will be victim to the seduction and they come along and they tempt you and they say, if you have this widget, your life will be made infinitely better. And if you're mad, you're sucked into it and you believe it. And I think the problem is, is it's on billboards everywhere. It's everywhere. You know, I was in London recently for the London Book Fair and could not believe the size of the adverts. It was like it was like a scene from Blade Runner. <laughs> What is going on in London? Oh, my God, it's everywhere. And so, you know, when you kind of believe that that's normal life, when you're when you're brainwashed into thinking this is what everyone does, then you go along like a lemming or a sheep and you just do what everyone else does. And it I think 10 years ago when I was writing about this stuff, the people that were saying, I don't want to do this and I want an excuse to not do this anymore but I don't want to feel like a freak um they were I mean people were downshifting 10 years before them you know this has been going on for a long long time but it's um it's 
sort of getting a bit more of a foundation to it. And it's it's people who are normal everyday people, normal everyday folks. And by that, I, I don't wish to disparage anybody that's uh, living more of a hippie lifestyle or, you know, quite relaxed to sort of drop out and live off grid, that kind of thing. But there are lots more CEOs. There are lots more people in high powered positions or managerial positions who are saying, do you know what? I can't remember the last time I had sex with my partner. Oh, I know. I think I need to think about my life again. If people are booking in time with their partners to, to connect, that when you have that going on, you realize that your world is falling apart and it's not running the way that it should. You need to put emphasis on life. The work-life balance thing needs to err towards life and downshifting definitely opens that door for you. Right. Do you think that it, it's becoming more sort of normal for people to think about downshifting? Because say even like five, 10 years ago, I personally, for example, I'd be made to feel like a failure if I wasn't always striving to get more and more and more and more stuff and, you know, work harder to get that stuff. Um, but I think since the, you know, austerity and all the, the financial collapse and everything, do, do you think more people are now starting to reassess their lives and, and look at them a different way? They are definitely. And also you talked about it, you know, is it perceived as being a bit more normal? Definitely. And I think a lot of that has been born from developments of corporate social responsibility policies from work, workplaces, many, many workplaces who have realized in their infinite wisdom that if they're actually kinder to their staff, for example, by setting up um, a, a car share scheme, just as a small example, they say, if we set up a car share scheme and we accept the fact that a group of people are going to come in one car, which is good, less traffic on the roads, this is good, uh, they're, they're going to get here a bit later, that's fine. Uh, they will have maybe been able to take their kids to school before they came in to work. If we have them in for less, we give them that responsibility and treat them a bit nicer, they'll actually put a bit more effort into their day of work. So, it's about it's a trade off, isn't it? Or they'll say maybe um, in our corporate social responsibility policy, we'll encourage you to work from home one day a week or a couple of days a month so that you can do other things. You can still be effective, but you don't have to be on the road. And so as that has all started to um, find its way onto the uh, the global workplace, uh, I think that, that that has definitely made a difference to uh, people's attitudes because they they know they can they can get more from their employees if they're kinder if they if they think about the rest of their life and their work life balance. Um, so that is normalizing it because if big companies are doing it and allowing it then it must be good, it must be true, and there must be a benefit to doing it. Uh, I, I know there's um, a lot of the sort of the, the younger companies or the sort of small to medium companies are, are trying to do these things, give, giving people like uh, much more flexible arrangements in terms of, you know, if they're full-time staff, they, they can sort of choose their hours a bit, a bit more fluidly and that kind of thing. But at, at the same time, you've got this sort of issue with, you know, as the economy gets worse and worse, which is inevitable as we run out of fossil fuels, we still, people still need money to get the basics of life. So, you know, a house, somewhere to live, food, electricity, internet. Yeah, you're right. You, you do have to have money. I think that anybody that thinks that downshifters are dropouts haven't got a clue. Downshifters are the most entrepreneurial people of all. They know how to make all the money uh, work out. They know how to, to do the budgeting um, because they've, they've, they've got a, a, a complete understanding of what money is and how it works. I think that um, there's a, a simple strap line that I've used to describe downshifting for many years, and it holds true. Um, the more money you spend, the more time you've got to be out there earning it, and the less time you get to spend with the people you love. That's it. That's it in a nutshell. So if you take that 
that simple sentence and you embrace it, you give it a positive embrace instead of saying, oh, I'm 100 quid down this month because I didn't take that overtime because I took the kids to school or whatever the scenario is. Um, if you embrace it and say, do you know what? I managed to take the kids to school and they were dead chuffed that I was there. It was just lovely. I didn't have to pay a child binder, but my money's down. Oh, well, never mind. I, I saw the kids. I, I saw their pictures on the wall at school. You know, there are so many benefits to 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 pulling away from earning the money um, and actually having life. Uh, yeah. And that that definitely rings true. Do, do you think, though, that there's a risk that as the economy gets worse, though, because you've got two sort of effects that are taking place at the moment. On the one hand, you've got things like technological unemployment. So more and more people are being replaced by, you know, machines or software, websites, things like this. Yeah. And at the same time, you've got the, the general downturn in the global economy due to the things like peak oil and peak gas and, and so on. There's less and less full-time jobs and a lot of the part-time jobs that are cropping up don't even pay a living wage so people might be working a full week and only just scraping by with, with, with the mere basics of life um because the you know the basically paid a pittance and a lot of people are on these things called zero hour contracts yes i know i know i know that is that is quite terrifying i um came across that earlier this week um i i take both of your points and uh i would say that the that all of it, downturn in economy, that's going to continue on. The stuff that's occurring as a result of peak oil, which I think is going to have a massive impact. I mean, I'm not a doom and gloom girl. Believe me, I am not. But I know we're going to have power shortages. We're going to have fuel shortages. We're going to be colder. We're going to have to put jumpers on. Lots of stuff is going to change on our landscape, on our physical landscape, we are going to see those drones out there delivering things where people could have had a job to do a simple delivery job. We're going to see machines overtaking in a completely terrifying way, if you ask me. Um, uh, I live in, uh, in the sticks, really. Um, we have a couple of banks in our high street. One of them has recently closed. It's not my bank, and I thank goodness for that um because i like going in and speaking to my people but it has closed because everybody's using the hole in the wall outside where's where's the logic in that you know go inside if there's a queue queue up and talk to the person in the queue you know keep those people in their jobs we need people in their jobs we 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 cannot let ourselves be swallowed by advances in technology. Um, and I'm not a Luddite, don't get me wrong, I'm talking on a computer to you. There has to be a level of um, technology that sustains us and keeps us all going. But I think things are being developed for development's sake. And they're just, I mean, it's just, I, I hate to say it, and I use this analogy a lot, but it's Terminator creeping up on us. And the whole Skynet thing, the whole intelligence, you know, the more I read, about computers sharing their knowledge and they're, they're, they're this one uni mind that will teach other robots and other computers how to behave, how to how to give us their best service. I just think it's terrifying. It's quite mad. Yeah, that's the um, the the thing that they're using for uh, I think is it military robots and stuff like that as well. Yeah, there are lots of them. There there are lots. They're doing all sorts of things, weird and wonderful things, and I just think it's a step too far. I really do, for many, many reasons. We're forgetting, you know, you talked earlier on in this um, conversation about money. I think uh, one of the reasons why we've become quite uh, – why why the credit card thing, I have, which I think still has a bit of a too big a grip um, on us, why the credit card thing has seduced so many people, and that's because they forgot what money looks like. And uh, when I went to uh, work, when I got my first job, I would come out of my job at the end of the week on the Friday and I would draw the money out of my bank to pay to my mum for keep, for, for my put aside for my train fare to get to work the next week or the next month or however I was doing it. And my my money, my physical money for me, for whatever I needed. And I saw that money in my hand. I had a feel of, I, you know, I knew what it meant to have money in my hand. And I think the trouble is, is everything is store cards. Everything is, 
and even that is disappearing now it's like you wave a piece of plastic at a machine and it will take your uh, take your money away and what terrifies me greatly is that this is money is being further removed from the hands of our children by way of this biometric paying um you know your kids have to sign up to have their fingerprints uh, stored on the school's computer system so that they can pay for their school lunches. Not in my house. Not in my house, I tell you now. Uh, they go into school with a lunch. Um, but I don't want them paying for things with their fingerprint for so many reasons. They're just losing what money is. And it's difficult to fight against the machine when when everybody is saying, this is the way it's going. It doesn't have to. You can put your foot down and say, actually, no, I'll stick with making my own lunch uh, and having money in my hands. But it's it's your, you know, you're going against the, the grain by doing that. But I believe that it's worth fighting for. I really do. Yeah, I mean, personally, I'd, I'd be much happier with a world that didn't have money. You know, essentially, money's just a, a shared delusion that we've inherited from our ancestors. Quite. I'm sure you probably know my dear friend, um, Mark Boyle, the moneyless man, who has a, a moneyless manifesto, which is, um, which is terrific. Uh, I, I would say that there is a need for a form of uh, credit in some way. I think the transition town networks and the let's system in this country, which is expanding beautifully, um, is embracing uh, other ways of paying for things and encouraging people to to use those ways, bartering, sharing, swapping your uh, your stuff, keeping you know longevity. When you go out to buy something, buy something that has longevity in it. My cooker, when I've finished our interview, I shall have a big cup of tea and that will come from my cooker, which is sat on the stove, which has a lifetime guarantee. Um, you know, what can you say? Buy something that's going to last you a long, long time. Um, invest in things in a different way. Think about repairing things. Think about finding out how something works. Stitch stuff up. Learn how to knit. All these things are really going to come back into play in the not too distant future when we are really faced with some very massive shortages. And I truly believe we will be um, grow things in the garden. You know, you were talking about having a bit of time off from your normal busy schedule and doing, doing different things, you know, going out and smelling the roses, learn how to plant a few things in your garden. Um, I have a rented, I live in a rented house and uh, it has no garden. It has, astroturf on the I mean can you be so depressing um but I went to a local garden center and I went around the back of the local garden center where they had all their broken pots uh, over the last two years and I have relieved them of their broken pots which are fine there's nothing wrong with them uh, but they can't sell them and they'd have to send them off to landfill and I have things growing in there that I can eat I only have things growing in my garden that I can eat uh, and flowers, obviously, some flowers to kind of uh, attract the bees to do their job. But I'm growing stuff in my garden, in a garden that's not a garden. I can manage to do it. You know, a, a, a wonderful lady called Valerie um, Azul Thome, T-H-O-M-E. She had a wonderful uh, project in a North London, on the roof rather, of a North London supermarket called um, uh, Food from the Sky. And they were growing with a with a community project, with the help of a community project. They were growing loads and loads of food on the roof of this supermarket in North London and selling it, you know, through the shop downstairs. Genius. Brilliant. Wherever anyone says, do you know what? We can't do that there because there's not the space. Oh, yes, you can. You just haven't thought about it enough. Yeah, there's always a way to do it. Always. You know, even if it's just like, you know, growing, uh, take the, the cuttings from vegetables that you've cooked with. If you cut the bit with the roots off and stick it in a glass of water or something on your kitchen windowsill, it'll usually grow into a, a new onion or whatever, you know. So, so there's always a way. But do you not see that by by doing those things, you're, you're actually meaning that the, the companies who used to provide those things to you are now getting less custom. So they're downsizing and people are losing the jobs anyway. You know, you mentioned before that you know people need jobs, but my personal perspective is we don't. I don't think people do need jobs. The only pe reason people need jobs is to 
make enough money to survive. Whereas a, a lot of the things we need to survive are, are now, you know, we're, we're almost doing like a, a modern version of what we used to do uh, centuries ago, where centuries ago, each household would provide for all its needs. You know, they'd, they'd grow all their own food and they'd, they'd get their own water and things like that. And we're starting to sort of develop a more sort of technologically advanced way of doing that now, where, you know, people might be using aquaponics or something instead of just having a, a vegetable plot. Um, and we've got solar panels for electricity and, you know, all these kind of things. So f from where I'm coming from, I don't actually think jobs are a good thing. I think if people want to work, like at the, the farm where I volunteer, we all want to do that. I... I I completely understand what you're saying and I, I, I applaud your position. I think that the chaos theory will leave us with people who, for whatever reason, will need to have the structure of a full-time job or a part-time job and to work. Society just could never be, um, it could never wear the hat of all those volunteers. I volunteer as well and I know how much of a buzz you get from doing something that is a community thing, that is um, a, a really incredibly positive uh, job with a proper benefit at the end of it. I really do. Stuff you can eat or stuff you can do, ways you can lift and heal and help people. Um, but not everybody gets that. You know, why doesn't everybody shop in the charity shops? It's the same question, isn't it? For me, it's madness. Why would you shop anywhere else? I only buy all my clothes from the charity shop. That's where I go because, and secondhand and so on, because it's it's important to me to put that money back into my community. But for other people, they wouldn't be seen dead in a charity shop. And I suppose, you know, if everybody thought that way, we'd never get any good bargains. So chaos theory is going to kind of filter people out and it's going to have those that are working and doing their thing, which is fine. It's going to have those that want to volunteer more and actually help their society, their, their local and their global communities, which is also good. And it's going to have people growing and doing and, and really being totally off grid at the other end of it. And they work full time. But as you say, they don't work per se. They haven't got a P45 at the end of their, uh, their, their, their time of working and a pay slip. Yeah, they're just living life under their own steam basically exactly and they're, they're doing things under their own steam and i think that yeah it is the chaos theory will always just give us a massive selection of all of those people um and we can't you the the great thing about downshifting downshifting is wonderful and you cannot force it upon anybody it's like it's the kiss of death it really is it the difficulty comes when you have a couple, traditionally a couple, maybe he's the one at work and he's never, never at home. She's the one at home. She doesn't want all the stuff. She wants to see her husband. Like I say, she wants to, they want to have time together. And he's too busy running around chasing the money and he's buying all these gifts for the kids. And so the kids are kind of getting disjointed from the family unit because they're never together and blah, blah, blah. But hey, they go to Barbados for three weeks a year or whatever it is. And they've got that. The, the, the spare house and the boat and all the rest of it, all the gadgets, and their life is soulless. And she wants to ditch that stuff because she wants to have a connection with him. And he just thinks, I can't do that. If I get off this, then we're not going to have the stuff and no one's going to be happy and blah, blah, blah. It's so difficult when he doesn't get that. In this example, it's a he, she, and she really does. You've got two people connected, but on totally different pages. You have to sing from the same hymn book. I think when you um, when you do, everything is possible. You know, I mean, absolutely everything, uh, everything where you live, how you live, what you eat, what you grow, what you do, what you spend and what you don't spend and the benefits you get from not spending and having better quality love with your partner, love and connection with your children and your families and your friends. You have better mental health and well-being because you stop long enough in your day to have a five minute meditation, just to listen to nothing other than the birds singing. You bake your own bread. You get your hands dirty in the soil. You do really simple, basic, very basic Neanderthal things. Uh, you know, the stuff that they would have done back then. You see a nice bit of roadkill and think, do you know what? That'll make a lovely pie and make the best of gifts that have been put in front of you. I think we need to stop and look at the abundance that surrounds us. 
and see what what bit of that abundance turns us on. Is it a food thing? Is it a time thing? Is it a, a, a better relationship thing? Something will work for you. That's something will turn you on to that way of thinking. And if you just dip your toes into trying that thing um, and embrace it and work out how you can achieve more of that thing, then that will motivate you to work towards it. And it will also help you to fight not fight, but combat the resistance of a partner that may be, you know, coming from, like I said, um, a different page. So, you know, there's probably going to be people listening that are thinking, you know, I'd quite like to work a bit less and, and do more, spend more time doing things they enjoy that haven't sort of made that first step yet. What would you say to them? I would say if they really are in those early stages, then they need to pick up a couple of the suggestions that are on Downshifting Week's website. Um, it's uh, Downshifting Week is totally non for There's no profit. There's no money in it. It's I'm not trying to sell anything. I don't have a book or a CD that you could buy and get it all in a box. Um, it's just suggestions, you know, go on there and try them. But I would say something as simple and as massively symbolic as cutting up a credit card. Cutting up a credit card, open your wallet and look at the stuff inside your wallet. If you are thinking, if you're listening to this and thinking, oh, I'd like a little bit of that action, open up your wallet, look inside it. Have you got store cards? Have you got credit cards? More than one? Have you got two? Have you got another one tucked at the back just for good measure, just in case? Take them out of your wallet. Get the scissors and slice them up. It's a big thing to do and I realize you can you can go two or three days down the line and then think you know what I'm going to ring them up and get it I'm going to get it back I'm going to get it sent in the post I'll say I've lost it um if you cut it up into pieces what you're saying to yourself is I'm going to make more of an effort to live within my means I'm not going to to buy that stuff that's going to put me into debt and then oh you know I'll pay it back I'll, I'll get it paid I'll get it paid just cut it up don't have it you don't need stuff. You need a shirt on your back. Um, uh, you need some food in your belly. And you can do those things on a real, real budget. You can. You can do it on a real, real budget. But get there slowly. Spend less money. Like I said, the more money you spend, the more time you've got to be out there earning it. And the less time you get to spend with the people you love or doing the things that you love. And that should be a good enough motivation to get going with spending a bit less money. Of all the, the sort of things that you've done over the years, is the one that sort of stands out as the, the thing that you, you're sort of the most pleased with? That's a very interesting question. Yeah, to be honest, I think that I've had a lot of these things, this, this kind of um, want to connect back with nature more, to grow stuff that I didn't know how to do, to rear chickens and, you know, do things with things that I, I was born and brought up in East London. You know, I, my parents never, my mum never taught me how to cook and do stuff. Um, I had not a clue. I've had to sort of learn how to do things myself. I think that you can um, do lots of things if you're dealt one hand and, you know, if you're dealt a hand in life, and uh, you you don't have all the tools to make a change. It doesn't matter. You can find them if you if you're determined to do it. You will do it. Um, yeah. So I think really I've had kind of the simple green living girl inside me forever. I think it's always been there. And um, I suppose maybe the one thing that has made me feel like I've been a part of people's change is. Uh, by putting together the downshifting week and being asked about it, being asked for my opinion on it. My opinion counts. You know, I'm a normal everyday mum of, of children and I, I'm a regular person and I manage to do a great many downshifted things. And I do it with, with a willing and positive and proud embrace. Um, and I consider myself to be perfectly normal. And I think if someone else thinks that my opinion is good and valid enough to go on the radio and to, to talk to other people, then I know, I know I can influence other people to say, I think I'm going to give that a try. She sounded like she had it sorted out. I haven't got all of the world's uh, ills cured in my head. There are far too many out there for me to cure, but I think I can definitely make a positive impact in this uh, particular field and uh, 
that's that's the main thing. Do it with positivity. Pass on that message with love and uh, encouragement. Um, and nurture people, teach people how to make bread. You know, next time you're making jam, if you've got friends that have never done it before, ask them to come around, see how you do it. Find out how to do stuff. Think about the way that you spend money um, and, and change that. Put longevity at the front of it. Put recycling high up on the list of reasons why you buy something. Change your perspective. Ditch this technological madness that is squashing us and um and tell other people that's the way to do it spread the message that's the way to do it so yeah that's my thing i'm most proud of being part a tiny part i'm a grain of sand on a massive beach and that beach is spreading the message and i'm very proud to be part of it oh brilliant so when is downshifting week it is the last full week of every um, every April. So it's 21 to 27 this year. And uh, yeah, my suggestions are for you to have a look at the website, which is downshiftingweek.com. Um, there's a list of various suggestions on there. Find something that makes you go, oh, that's a good idea. And have a go on the first day. And if you like it, and if you like how you feel, try something else the next day. And equally, move on through the week and keep your focus nice and simple. Don't give yourself too high a target for that period of time. Just just embrace it gently and get to the end of it and assess yourself. Assess how it made you feel to do those things. You know, another suggestion is book a half day off work and go out with your partner or yourself or your family, whoever you want to go out with. Go with someone you really like. And do something other than DIY. Don't have half a day off and then go and clean the car. Do something nice. The weather's meant to be great this next couple of weeks. Do something simple. Go find out how to grow some stuff. The, the wild garlic's going to start coming up soon. Go out and find out what wild garlic looks like and, and take some out of the hedgerow and make some wild garlic pesto. Do some stuff. Do some simple stuff and see how it makes you feel. Listen to how your body tells you you feel and embrace it and do a little bit more each day. I think that'll hopefully motivate a lot of the listeners to, uh, you know, just take a look at them, you know, look at the lives and think, how can I make this a bit simpler and enjoy life a bit more? That's that's wonderful. That is that is wonderful. I'm, I'm, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. And I guess one last little bit that I would say is is look local, look at what's under your nose. You probably have no idea all of the great things that are going on. Find out if you've got anyone doing a transition town movement in your town or nearby. Speak to them. Go along and talk to them. S go to a green drinks. Do you know about green drinks? These are all people that are thinking the same thoughts as you. They've got sustainability running through the middle of them. And you will find out lots of stuff that's going on where you live. Volunteering in your local community. See what's out there. Sniff out your local hedgerows. Find your local producers of really good food and support them. Pull back from the big supermarkets. We can do a lot to our local high streets. We can do such a lot if we just change our habits gently, one little bit at a time. And um, above all, keep yourself sustainable. Uh, it's You were saying um, before we uh, had this interview that you understood fully the whole running around, doing the work thing and uh, trying to get the message across and it being really important, but actually burning out while you're doing it. Um, you have to keep yourself sustainable as an individual or you're never going to get the message across. Do what you can do, but be realistic about it. You know, don't go flat out. It's a very bad way to burn out. Um, and yeah, just just. Just kind of think about yourself, keep yourself sustainable. That's the key to it all. Okay, Tracy, that's been fantastic. My pleasure. And uh, I hope we can maybe speak again uh, sometime in the future. You can call anytime you like at all. Uh, and I'll just remind myself to get a very large cup of tea in before we start. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks, Tracy. You're welcome. See you.